My name is Jeanette. I live in Kamamvi in the Gihara district. The genocide began in 1994. That's when we began to be persecuted. At that time, the neighbors started killing people. They took my parents to the river and tied their hands and feet. Then they threw them into the water. When they had stolen everything in the house and taken the livestock, they set everything on fire. Rwanda, a small republic in the eastern part of Central Africa. Mountains, rivers, and hills as far as the eye can see, most of which are inhabited by small villages. This land of a thousand hills is one of the most densely populated nations in the world. The country has a turbulent and bloody past, owing to the age-old power struggle between the Hutu and Tutsi tribes, which has lasted over centuries. The German and later Belgian colonial powers reinforced and supported the Tutsi, who were the ruling minority. It was mandatory for ethnic affiliation to be stated in personal identity papers. The Hutu were considered to be anyone possessing less than 10 head of livestock the majority of the population in Rwanda. As the country moved toward democracy, the Hutu, who until now had been at a clear political disadvantage, suddenly became aware of their democratic power as the majority. This led to the violent change of power in 1959. From then on, the Hutu were in power. Then, in 1994, following the death of the then president, the most devastating blow against the Tutsi began. This genocide was one of the most gruesome ever recorded in history. It lasted three months. My name is Immaculate. I became a widow during the genocide. I'm 43 years old. I have six children. In 1994, the war began. Never in my life had I ever experienced anything like that. Even I was incapable of telling the difference between the ethnic groups. My sister and brother have spouses from another ethnic group. When the genocide began, I had five children and was pregnant with my sixth child. The time came when I found out that all the Tutsi were being persecuted. I had no idea that I myself was a Tutsi. It was a very difficult time for me. I took my children and we hid in the bush. It was shortly before I was due to give birth. I ended up giving birth to the baby in the most difficult circumstances in the bush. My other children helped me at the same time in the distance. I could hear the screams of the victims as they perished. My brothers and sisters were killed, as well as my own mother. From April to July 1994, almost a million people lost their lives as a result of a meticulously planned massacre. This genocide was both premeditated and fueled by carefully targeted media propaganda. Following the assassination of the president, Hutu militia forced the population to participate in murdering the Tutsi, who were held responsible for the attack. Those who did not participate in the frenzy aroused suspicion.
Overcoming the tendency to think in terms of ethnic groups became an urgent priority for the new state of Rwanda. Since 1999, the National Commission for Unity and Reconciliation has been working on the development of appropriate measures such as training programs for the prevention of violence and the promotion of reconciliation. Rwanda has uh, tried everything it can do to restore justice and reconciliation that has been lost for quite a long time. And of course, among the solutions we've undertaken is the Gachacha jurisdiction. Gakacha is an ancient tradition in Rwanda. Under the leadership of trustworthy people, it brings the victims and the perpetrators in the village face to face. The goal? To uncover the truth, to find out what really happened. Even today, this method constitutes an important basis for reconciliation and the acknowledgement of pain and suffering. Whoever confesses his guilt here can expect not to be punished. It was a Thursday, the 7th of April, 1994. After the assassination of the then president, a group of young people came up to me. They were shouting that the Tutsi had murdered Habyarimana, and because of that, all Tutsis had to be killed. Everyone who was there was made to stand in a line. Then all the Tutsi had to step forward. These were the ones who had to be killed. Then they began to beat the Tutsi. At that point, I had no idea what was going on. Some people were beaten to death, and at first I just watched. But since the order had come from above, I was also obligated to help. Yes, I also participated in the killing. During the genocide, some people came to take us down to the Nyabarongo River. That's where I lost my parents and my elder brother. I saw when they were thrown into the river. The three people that I killed are members of Pierre's family. We brought these three people down to the river and tied their hands and feet. The police officers confirmed that they were the people we had to exterminate. We then pushed the people into the water, and some of them jumped in almost of their own accord because they were afraid of the machetes. We pushed the ones who hesitated, and the ones who were afraid were literally thrown in. I felt an intense sadness after all these events, but there was really nothing I could do. It just happened. I was persecuted along with the others. They hunted us like beasts. One day, as I was approaching Naya Binkenki, a survivor recognized me, and I was arrested. That was how I ended up in Naya Binkenki, in prison. At that time, when I killed people, it was as if I had no conscience, but today I know that I am guilty. The moment I confessed my crimes, I felt a release. My heart became light. I was told that those who confessed that they were guilty would be released so that they could go to the people and ask forgiveness. That's when I met Pierre. I killed several members of his family. I asked him to forgive me, and I offered to help and support him in his daily life in any way that I could. We always got on well as neighbors. Our parents were even good friends. We had no problems with each other at all. 
the fact that people were manipulated by others to commit murder helped me to forgive more readily. Pierre and Ezekiel work side by side, repairing the houses which were destroyed. All the villagers help them with their work. In this way, fresh mutual trust can develop between all those concerned. We found that Pastor John's seminars on reconciliation were very beneficial for us in the reconciliation process, which, in our case, had already begun. The seminars on reconciliation really helped us to restore our relationship. That was where we were finally reconciled. Little by little, I began to understand what forgiveness really means and in the end I was ready to forgive. The Bible tells us that we should forgive one another, even when the other person is not willing to ask for forgiveness. In my case, the perpetrator was willing. Since Ezekiel, who killed the members of my family, was so sincere in asking for forgiveness, it was also easier for me to forgive. The way we live and work together today is good, despite the sadness we feel about the things we have gone through. I ask God to forgive me, and I've also forgiven myself, so that today I feel free. Our reconciliation is demonstrated in a very practical way, insomuch that we now share our lives together and we work and eat here. Today I feel good, but not completely healed. I still feel some pain but God is helping me to deal with it. You can hide the truth, but of course there is the conscious. When you talk to most of these people, they tell you, I've been defeated by conscious, by the heart. And to me, this is a strong signal that reconciliation is possible. There are also other organizations, be it faith groups, who are helping the commission, especially in the prisons. Uh, to, to, to encourage prisoners to confess, but on the, other side to, on the other side to prepare victims to be able to accept this confession and of course, in the long run, work together towards reconciliation. The Christians too, and their various church denominations, have begun to seek to restore their broken relationships, to work together, to promote the reconciliation process, and to speak openly about it. We are still going through this process, but you can see Hutus and Tutsis attending church together. People who were enemies in the past can be seen praying and worshipping together today. Pastor John actively promotes the reconciliation and follows the process closely. He visits prisoners and leads groups in the villages, where victims and perpetrators meet in the reconciliation workshops. Until now, the prison ministry has always been particularly interested in seeing lives genuinely transformed. 
In other words, that through the Word of God, the perpetrators, as well as the victims, can be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. They can change their attitudes, change their behavior, change their point of view as far as their social relationships are concerned, and experience a radical change for the positive. We didn't know Pastor John before, but we had heard that he brings victims and perpetrators together. And so we were ready for this process. He came and strongly advised us to forgive and not yield to thoughts of vengeance. As a result of his advice, we came to the point where we were both ready and willing to forgive. Since at that time it was actually a Hutu who hid me and thus saved my life, I now realize that it wasn't really the Hutu who committed these evil deeds, but the devil himself. That is why I also felt that I had to forgive the perpetrators. Even now I can feel how God is carrying me through it all. Otherwise it would have been far too much for me to bear. Even for those Christians who have been transformed by the Spirit of God, it's difficult for them to forgive. It's difficult for them to ask for forgiveness. It's difficult for them to live in harmony with one another. And that is precisely where the workshops for healing and reconciliation play a vital role. Once we spent the night right here in this place. Hutu and Tutsi had run to take cover in the church. Nobody really knew what was going on. Some people from the armed forces came and announced that all the Tutsi had now to be killed. When the Interahuamui people came, we were very surprised that they wanted to include all of us too, that we should participate in killing the Tutsi. If we Hutu had refused, we ourselves would have been in danger. Then we went to the family of one of my uncles. He's a Hutu. We thought he would protect us, but he refused. Just at that moment, the Interahamwe people came to arrest us and take us away. All this happened in front of my uncle's house and his family. They simply shut the door in our faces. They told the Interahamwe people that they did not know me or my brothers and sisters and that they should just take this vermin away. After having escaped death, we began to hate our uncle and the Interahamwe people who had threatened us. I felt angry with myself, angry with everybody, and especially angry with God. I wanted revenge. As far as I was concerned, none of them had anything positive to offer. After I heard the good news of the Bible, peace entered my life through Jesus Christ. I began to think about these people. I realized that I hated them intensely. And it became clear to me that because of this hatred, I was actually sinning on a daily basis. Then I wondered if I could live in eternity with God while harboring such hatred in my heart. I had no inner peace. That, with the pastor's help, was the thing that finally impelled me to go and see these people.
When Solange came to our home to say that she forgave us, we felt very relieved. It was almost like before. Yes, it was almost like before because before the war, we really had no problem with each other. Yes, I see, since we were able to give and receive forgiveness, we feel as if we are one again, despite the deaths in our family. Ever since I took the first step and visited these people, and ever since we were able to speak about the past, I have felt peace enter my heart. We were also able to cry together, and I had to rid my heart of many things. That meeting took place right here in this house. Since that day, and even now, I have found the joy of living once again. And I thank God so much that today these people are very dear to me. On the 6th of April, 1994, we learnt that the president's plane had been shot down on the radio. It was announced that the Tutsi had done it and that we now had to get to work, namely to eliminate the Tutsi. We were required to separate the wheat from the tares. And then machetes and weapons were distributed by the officials. Then, on the 7th of April, we came here, we arrested people and killed them. That year in 1994, we lost some of our family members. We did not know who the murderers were, but as we preached the good news in the prison, we learned that Kamu Zinzi was also there, along with some others. In prison, I heard the word of God. I was deeply moved by this word, and I regretted everything I had done. I confessed everything. All of them were members of Jean-Claude's family. When he was released from prison, he came to a rehabilitation camp. Deep down, we felt that we should not judge him, because it was clear that an evil force had been at work in him. Kamozinski and Jean-Claude were sworn enemies. Now they work together. Since 1999, they've been relentlessly traveling throughout the country, sharing the story of how their relationship was restored in churches and in remote public places. Right from the start, I felt a call to go to the perpetrators, even in the Congo, and to bring them the message of forgiveness. To do this, I used the film as a tool. At first, I did not exactly know who had murdered the members of my family. Then, in prison, I showed the Jesus film, and the murderers were deeply moved by the film. They came to me and confessed that they had also killed members of my family. So I went to them too and told them that I forgave them with all my heart, and that I had no feelings of vengeance towards them. At this time, I made a point of going to Kamuzinzi in particular, and I told him that when I go to be with Jesus in eternity, I would like him to be there too. I feel genuine peace. People accept me. They have forgiven me. Now I will have to face Kakacha justice, where I will have the opportunity to confess my guilt openly. I know I have asked for forgiveness, and I have been forgiven. And this is why I can live in peace with people. There are people who are really hard on the inside and they refuse to accept 
that it's possible to forgive. I go and speak to these people with Kamunzinzi, and I show them the man that killed the members of my family. Jesus tells us that if we do not forgive others, our guilt will not be forgiven either. Jesus even says that we should forgive our enemies. And Kamunzinzi was my sworn enemy, and I have forgiven him. Kamunzinzi killed 14 members of my family and destroyed their houses. And when the people hear that, they fall on their knees and they acknowledge that they too must forgive. Thank <laughs> you.